All right. Um, I think it'd be important before I get started, let's take a moment and just um, this whole message, let's lay it before the Lord. Father God, um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here, for the calling you've placed on my life, uh, for everybody that you've placed in this room today, uh, the fact that we get to open your word and we get to talk about you and what you've done in, in, in history and how you've set us apart um, in amazing ways. And I just ask that this message would bless and edify your body today. Uh, bless my tongue, give me boldness. Um, just be a good steward of the skills and the things that you've blessed me with. In your name we pray, amen. All righty then. So we're going to close out the chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. We've um, worked through it the last two previous times that I was with you and able to preach. Um, and Marianne, did you do that on purpose, the scripture reading? Where are you? Nice. Fist bump. Yeah, that was awesome. I was like watching it, like, did she mean to? So that was great. Um, so yeah, I think... Before we read that, let's just talk a little bit about Corinth and who they were um, and Paul's interactions with them. So um, historically, Corinth was a very influential city. It was the capital of Achaia. It had actually been completely destroyed previously, and it was rebuilt 100 years later by Julius Caesar. It just got wiped off the map. But because of the location that it was at, um, it was on a narrow strait between the Peloponnesian Peninsula and the Attic Peninsula, which where um, Athens was, uh, and trade went through there. So there was a lot of trade. There was a lot of money. There were um, the Temple of um, Diana was there. Thank you for the help there. Uh, and they had a bunch of temple prostitutes. Um, prostitute temple worship was just expected of people at that time. Uh, so affluence, significance, and idolatry and corruption were all things that made up Corinth. And they even had a word. It was called uh, to Corinthianize or to act the Corinthian. Uh, if you recall, we, I described it previously. If, if you would take New York City and combine it with Las Vegas today, that's kind of the idea that you get when you think about ancient Corinth. And Paul's heard some things, and he's writing back to them. He was with them for a year and a half, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 18. He's writing back to them to set some things straight and to deal with this baby church that's dealing with some really big issues. So let's start at chapter 1 and just read through the whole chapter so we can get a, a good understanding of what the context is. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, theirs, their Lord, and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus that in everything you are enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'm just going to pause, make a little note, that section from verse 4 to 9, that is packed full. That's a lot of good stuff, and we will be visiting that quite a bit today. Now, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just it is, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So our passage that we're looking at here is starting in verse 25, going through 31. And I left a little, I call it a hangnail that would cause us to go back. So what we see going on in the letter is um, first Paul sets up, this is me, it's Paul, hey. And then he tells them all about themselves. Things that if you notice there in four through nine, they had nothing to do. They didn't earn a single one of those things that was true about them presently at that point. And then we get to verse 10 kind of the hinge of the entire chapter. They're having issues with disunity. They should be unified in their thoughts, but they're not. Why aren't they? In 11 through 16, we see that they are, they're clinging to their favorite preacher. Um, you know, things like maybe the way they speak, or maybe they're more religious and they baptized me and I've got this special standing. Paul's saying, no, no, no. None of that matters. In verse 17, I'm grateful for that verse so much, and we talked about it last time. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Right there, he sets the correct tone. The gospel's the real important thing. Baptism has a place. It certainly does for the church, but it's not paramount and central to what he's doing. So much so that he doesn't even fully remember. He has to sit there and think about it, of who he's actually baptized. Just adding to the fact that it's secondary. The focus is on the cross of Christ. And then in verses 18 through 20, Paul really kind of sets up his argument. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Notice there that it's actively happening. Active, perishing. Like uh, last time I used the example, it's like you're hanging out on the lazy river, but there's no way off. There's only one way off, and that's by belief that we see later. But they're going down a, a line, not realizing that they're going to their own destruction. To them, it's foolishness. But the same word of the cross to us who are being saved, presently being saved, it is the power of God. And then in verse 20, he kind of... he. He calls out the sides that exist, the wise men, the scribe, so the religious scholar that knows the Mosaic law, and the debater of this age. 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The answer there is yes, he has. And that leads into verse 21. And if you could pull up that slide, if you notice on the back side of your notes, I'm not doing slides today because I see squirrels. And when I have to go back and forth, I feel like that makes it harder for me to make sure I'm keeping my train of thought going. So I have one slide today for you. Otherwise, you'll have to follow along in your word. Um, I thought it was really important as I was just thinking about the chiasm that's going on in 21 through 25 and how if we understand it like a spearhead, which is what I I used, um, and it turned out way better than I was expecting. I did it, and I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, Good job, God. That wasn't me. It really shows us that the central thrust of what's going on here happens in 23a. And if you read it down, what's neat is, I have a laser pointer. That's dangerous. All right. Starting up here, if we read it down this way, is the way the text reads. And that makes sense. But what's neat is you can see how the argument closes itself. 21a, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. So here's the setup, and here's the closing statement. Here's why. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Quote, unquote, foolishness. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. So what it's saying there is no matter what man does, the so-called weakness and foolishness of God, they can never close that gap. The gap is always going to be too far and too wide. 21b to 24, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Notice, saving those who believe, preached, save those who believe. One, two, and then what comes next? but to those who are called. Notice that calling comes afterwards. Both Jews and Greeks, they're in a new category now, the called, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And then we see the parallels again in 22 and 23b. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. And what do they get? They get a stumbling block and foolishness. See, they're looking for those signs, but we say we have a crucified Messiah. Look for his body. You can't find it. And to them, it's like, that's absolute foolishness. I can't, I cannot possibly get on board with that. But what they don't recognize, to them, it's that foolishness going down their lazy river to destruction. It's the absolute thing that saves you. So Paul sets up this argument. And really what this is, is this is a big picture worldview of what God's doing at a grand scale through his divine will. And then we turn it to verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble. So that consideration there, Paul's turning a corner and saying, here's the big picture, now let's take it, look at yourselves we're going to understand what this looks like and how it works. And it's important that at every one of us, just like he's asking the Corinthian church to stop and look at where we came from with a sober mind, because you don't actually realize where it is you currently sit. If you don't know where you started out at and everybody in this room started out at, at a point of being damned. We did. It's true. And even though it's scary, The amazing thing is we're sitting here now and we can see how far we came. So your calling, that comes back to verse 21b that we see above. Preaching, saving those who believe, and here's the calling. I have, so it's the Greek word blepo. Sorry, Mary Cooper, if I said that wrong. Um, And what it means is to process information. Oh, excuse me. That was considering. As I was. For you army guys, you know what that means. Um, Clasis. It's an invitation to experience special privilege and responsibility. Notice it's not called to salvation. It's called to a special privilege and responsibility. There's a responsibility involved in that invitation. I think about my own calling 
where I came from, where I started, where I am now, um, the important part isn't about me, really. It's what God is doing in me. But it's not anything that I did to cause this situation to be just like any one of us in the room. We didn't cause ourselves to get where we are today. Some would like to say that faith is somehow a work, but it it really isn't because faith in the wrong object does absolutely nothing. It's a response. Right, Caleb? (laughs) So uh, we were at Ethnos this week, and Jeremy was talking about uh, faith not being a work, and he has a coffee cup with him, and he takes the sleeve off, and he throws it at Caleb, who's sitting in the room, and it pops him on the head. And uh, the <laughs> it took a fun turn after that. He's apologizing. Sorry, Jeremy, if you're listening. I didn't plan on bringing this up, but, you know, Caleb's here today, so you got to have some fun with it. We like to ad lib. Ah, there my other note is. With that calling, it comes back to verses 4 through 9. If you notice here, and I think it would be great if we, in our quiet time, read back through this and understand everything that's being said there is true about us right now. We're enriched in all knowledge, all speech, not lacking in any gift. We're going to be confirmed to the end, and we've been called into fellowship with his son. And that there were, past tense, not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. And this is all according to the flesh. That according to the flesh, when we see flesh, according uh, to man, uh, you know, in verse 25, it says wiser than men. Or if we see the world, you can highlight that all in the same way. and, And it would be accurate to say open rebellion according to the people that are in open rebellion, because that's what the world currently is. They are openly in rebellion to God. According to them, you weren't anything. Sure, there might have been, right? Because it doesn't exclude the fact that maybe somebody was actually wise according to the world standard, or maybe somebody was actually strong or of noble birth, or maybe they were rich. But it's kind of like when you're, you're a kid or maybe if you're raising a, a child right now and you say, you know, you're maybe playing catch and uh, this has happened certainly at our house and, and we're throwing like, yeah, I'm so awesome. Like, you know, you try and have that lesson of like, you know, there's always somebody better out there. So we need to have a humble attitude. Well, the truth is, according to the world, according to that identification, We didn't measure up even to the best that the world had. There was always somebody better. And I'm sure in this room, there's talents that we don't know about. Probably somebody that can play like the piano with their feet. Anyone? You have to raise your foot to answer that. (laughs) Okay, no, no. Um, You see, that's the thing the world finds value in. Nobility, money, strength, wisdom. We don't find value in that. And if we do just like what the Corinthian church was doing, that leads to a lot of issues. That leads to infighting. When we value what the world values, it's a path to at least punishment and and, um, correction. So then we see in verse 27, we have a strong contrast. The word but, and it's the word Allah in the Greek. So you have de- as normally meaning but, or it can mean and, but Allah is a strong form of contrast. So first they're being told, take a look at where you came from when you were called. But now understand that that position gives us the why. God chose the foolish things. It's all part of his divine will. And why did he choose the foolish things? Of the world, you know, you can mark that again in open rebellion to shame the wise of the world. And he chose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despise. This is all according to the world. God used things that weren't as valuable to the world. And isn't that his way? Um, you know, we think about the building project that we have going on right now. And uh, I think everybody in here could raise their hand and say, man, I wish that was done. But we don't want to be crafty with it. 
we want it. It wouldn't glorify God if we somehow got a huge loan and just got it done. That doesn't glorify God. Well, the same way here, if we somehow could figure it out, there's no glory to God being done, but God didn't need anything special from us. We literally just were, and then he did all the work. (laughs) So essentially what it's telling us there that to the world, we were like the, the gum on the bottom of your shoe. There's a fun story from my time in the army. Um, For most of you, well, I mean, you saw the picture, so now you know. Cat's out of the bag. Um, I did the army. I worked full-time for almost 11 years. And in that time, I met some very interesting people. And I'm going to tell you the story about one of them. So I won't tell you his name, just in case, because the story is not something he probably wants to get back to him. But he was kind of infamous in our unit here in Portage. Um, One annual training. We went out to the field, and going out to the field for anybody that's done it is not fun. It just isn't. You you know, if if you think going and shooting the guns with the Army is fun, your recruiter might tell you it is. But the Army has a way of taking the fun right out of it. Uh, You know, Army camping is not camping. It's suffering. Uh, So this guy, he... He understood the simple pleasures in life. A good cup of coffee in the field, chef's kiss. It was worth it. And he would bring his French press out to the field. And one morning, he was getting his coffee ready, and he had to use the bathroom, but it's just porta potties. And while he's in there, somehow the French press ends up in the hole. Did he leave it? No, he did not. He retrieved it. And he cleaned it up, and nobody wanted his coffee anymore. (laughs) That funny story, I think, parallels somewhat, you know, every analogy breaks down what God, how he viewed us, literally covered in excrement and filth. But see, this guy, he paid like $20 for this French, French press. But he did it before it had fallen in the filth. We were already in the filth, and God paid the ultimate price, the highest price possible. He paid at that moment for us. There is greatness to just sit there and think about that. And you have to wonder, well, you know, in verse 26, why do many, you know, why is it the lesser, quote unquote, of society that that find it more desirable? And I I thought a lot about this this week because it is true. I think if we look around, generally the people that have have it going on, they're all that in a bag of chips. Um, They're not as interested. Why is it? I kind of was thinking this week, you know, the lottery appeals to people. And I'll twist it back around. You know, I'm not saying it's the same. Um, It appeals to people because I think the lesser in society have a better perception of how vulnerable in life they truly are. You see, they get that paycheck to paycheck. One argument with their boss could mean they're going to be hungry for a while, or they need to hit up the food pantry, or they might lose their home or be sleeping out of the back of their car, or they understand they're not that strong, and somebody could just take their life, and there's not much they can do about it. But see, it's easy to be blinded when you have a bank account full of money, and you have a warm house, and you have a nice car, and you have all this going on. Not that it excludes people with those things. No, we welcome them in. But it's a lot harder to get get through all the noise to actually hear their ears, or to hit their ears, hear their ears, hit their ears, and actually reach and penetrate their heart. The amazing part of God's lottery is Jesus buys all the lotto tickets, and everybody wins the jackpot, and it's the biggest jackpot ever. You can't even number it. Those are my fun analogies for the day. We'll see if I have any more cooking. (laughs) It all comes down to why. Why did God do this? Why did God choose the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the despise? Like I said, the gum on the bottom of your shoe. Why did he choose those things to shame? Is it really nice? Is a kind and loving God going to shame the world? Ugh. Well. Let's think about it first. 
the world is in open rebellion. Plain and simple. Constantly, to this day, and there is no sign of letting up, and guess what? We've read to the end, and we know the world doesn't let up. It continues on in this foolishness. But there's something so cool about the word shame. I don't know if I should try pronouncing that. I'm not. (laughs) Where's Mary? Mary, raise your hand. Should I? It's okay. Kata kata hi sku no. (laughs) Well, that's fun. Well, so now you know. You can start Greek at any point. Um, (laughs) God can use it. It means put to the blush, confound, dishonor, be humiliated. That doesn't really seem like something that a loving God would do. And that's the argument that gets flipped around. One, we have to recognize that there is a creator-creature distinction. We will never break through that ceiling and be at God's level. And two, he is a righteous judge. But there's something so amazing in the Greek that I found, and I was like, I, it almost brought tears to my eyes. It's in the subjunctive mood. What does that mean? It's not necessarily guaranteed to shame them. Well, why would that be? Maybe because they don't have to sit there and be shamed. They can hear, and they can respond, and they can believe, and then they can be in the same place you and I are. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Verse 28, And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not. Not things, the nothings, the nothings of this world, so that he may nullify the things that are. The are things or the some things of this world. Here's the reason, so that no man may boast. And again, boast is in the subjunctive, meaning It could happen, but if you read the context of the sentence, it means it's not a possibility at all. It cannot happen in the presence of a holy and almighty God. See, that shame is there to correct thinking. And we get to be a part of it. The interesting thing about us being a part of it is look at what our job is. Throughout this whole section, what are we doing? Literally existing worshiping and honoring God. That's all that we do. God does the rest. Am I shining? I got this thing on my finger still. I guess I don't need my laser pointer. Your eyes are safe. (laughs) And by nullifying, he undoes their false power and their wisdom. He literally doesn't need anything fancy or special to do this. He does this in you and me. That's the crazy bit. If you sit down and you think about it, like, how does God... um, It's not just about his divine will. It's the power. You know, we can all say, I've got a divine will. I've, I, this is what I've destined to happen, but we don't have the power to back it up. It's a check our tush can't cash, so to speak, but God can. And how does he do it? Me and you and you and you, if you know Jesus, it just to sit there and think about the fact that God uses me in a way not to harm people, to smack them in the head and say, wake up before they eventually go off that cliff and there's no turning back. You don't get to reverse the ride while you're on it. But by his doing, by his divine power, he didn't stop at choosing. He did something about it. You are present, active, indicative. Currently, this is true about you in Christ Jesus. We see that in verse 23. He is the crucified Messiah. You are in him actively. Who became? When? Look back at verse 21b. That's when he became for us. When we heard the word preached and he saved us. He became to us what? Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Wisdom and power. That second whole category, you can put that in power. 
this is one of the most significant doctrinal uh, verses in the book, but certainly in the chapter, I would say it is the most significant. And what's interesting is it is not at all about our ability to believe here. No, that power, righteousness, declared righteous, credited to our account that we no longer have to face the penalty of sin. It's cleared from our record. Every sin and black mark against you is wiped away. Sanctification, that one's easy enough to understand. It's the power of, excuse me, saved from the power of sin in our life daily. We literally have the ability to not sin. That's mind-blowing if you think about it, because we can actually choose that. And if you've walked with Jesus long enough, you've probably come to a point where you're, you know, you, maybe you're doing First John 1, 9 in your own quiet time at home. I, I recommend if you ever are going to open the word, um, you know, have to make any tough decisions. I even had a point in my life where I had like a three o'clock alarm and every day it went off. I just made sure I'm, I'm getting it out there. But that you can actually sit there and go, God, please help me remember when I sinned. That's so cool. Now, verse 8 tells us, you who thinks he's without sin, hey, you better be careful because you can fall into a trap here. But the fact that we have the power of, we have power over sin in our life, not because of us, but because of Jesus, that's mind blowing. And this is where we are at currently. We're located in Jesus Christ in this power. And the last one, that's the golden ticket redemption. See, we have the final tense of salvation going on right here. The glorification. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and see this played out. I was debating whether I was going to go there, but because I don't like to bounce around too much because I, you know, I don't even like to use the surface. It, you know, I see squirrels. Chapter 8 of Romans, all about the glorification that's to come, the future hope that we get to look for, the, the fact that we are saved by God's power from the absolute presence of sin in our life. Verse 23. I'm debating if I want to start at 18. No, we'll just do 23. If you want, reading starting in 18, that whole section, great stuff to do in your quiet time. Not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but what hope? But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes what he already sees? What's the reason for all this? So that, just as it is, as it is written, Paul's reminding them, this isn't new. This isn't like a new thing I'm telling to you. This already is something that you know, and I'm going to repeat it for you. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It all comes back to worship, is absolutely what it's about. This is why in verse 28, the so that he may nullify and so that no one may boast. Here's what matters to God. And this all comes back. Some people will say the absolute essential thing for God is the fact that he saves people. I mean, that's up there. That's top 10 best hits. But the absolute reason we exist is to worship and honor our God and Savior. And how do we do that? We know who he is accurately, not what the world tells us, because the world wants to tell you that there's a cruel God that set you up to fail. That's absolutely not true. We rebelled against him. And number two, what he has done. It's always all about that. We exist to worship God alone. All right. So some application and conclusion. The reason why the Corinthian church struggled came back to an identity issue. You cannot think like the world and live holy. Can't do it. It is literally not possible. The way we think leads to our actions. And they didn't understand their identity in Christ. 
They didn't understand that they were enriched. They knew it, but they didn't think according to it. They didn't understand all the blessings they had. They knew it, but Paul had to repeat it to them. And he's breaking it down here in the fact that they literally are a part of God's divine, magnificent plan being unfolded in the world and using them, not by their own actions, by, but by his doing, to draw the world back to him. Literally salt and light. That should just make fireworks. And like mine, you know, the it, it absolutely kills me, the fact that it's not that hard. Yet, I make it really hard. Like, why did I yell at my kids? Well, because I was thinking like the world. I was not being a gracious father. Because if I'd think like God thought about me, I'd have a great, much greater room for patience and love. Not to his abilities, because I will always be finite. But it changes everything. Getting mad at somebody, um, feeling cheated, it, it all changes when I think about it according to God's word. And understanding what God says about you is actually what's true. Who you are is not according to the world. The world can think. The world's already labeled us. If you believe in creation, it's like one of the things in science they can still slap on you and just completely um, dismiss anything you have to say, call you a creationist, call you a Bible-believing Christian, a born-again they throw that at us. Where else in the world does that exist? And that's okay. I would, I would say that very few areas is that okay. But yet, it can be leveraged against us. But you know what's great? It doesn't matter because we know who wins. It literally doesn't matter. Don't pull your identification from the fact of what the world says about you. You are a saint. You're a child of the Most High God. I am too. That should change the way we live. And understanding this, right? We've talked about it a few times, that shame is never our job to do. We might be a part of it happening around us, but it's not about us. And just thinking about that shame, I do want to back up for a quick instant. Because how does that shame work a little bit? If you've ever struggled with addiction, or maybe adultery, or maybe lying or cheating or stealing, what else in the world can actually fix it but Jesus? Can their medicine? Can their psychotherapy? Can their books? Sure, it can help. Yeah, you can rubber band, slap your wrist all day. Eventually, you're going to fall back into it. They have no hope. They have no hope. We're the only place where an alcoholic can come and be cured. Otherwise, they're always just a recovering alcoholic. And that's fine if that's what they want to say about themselves. There is a possibility you could fall back into it. But eventually one day, you're going to have the true, real healing going on that nobody can ever take away from you. Coming back to my point of application, that shaming process isn't for us. But what it is, is we need to be sharing with people about who God is and what he's done in our life. Whether or not you think you have a testimony you do. He's done something. You can sit in your quiet prayer time and say, God, I know you've done amazing things in me. Give me eyes to see. Because I sit many times and I'm like, thank you, God, for this meal, <laughs> right? Thank you for my family. No, thank you for setting me apart. Thank you for saving me from the fires of the lake of fire. Thank you for giving me a new hope and a blessed calling. Along those same lines, understand your value is found in Christ Jesus. What somebody is willing to pay is what something is worth. When we do, if who likes Antiques Roadshow? Show of hands? No, what, nobody? Okay. Yeah, I know the older generations. Hey, I grew up on that stuff. It was like, Dad, can I stay up past eight? Yeah, Antiques Roadshow. And they would always say, hey, <laughs> I'll own that. I, it doesn't matter what the world says about me. I know who I am in Christ. 
they would always say, this is what we think it could fetch at auction. Well, why? Because what somebody is willing to pay for the thing, they can throw numbers all day long. Those numbers are just for insurance. But until somebody's willing to ca- hand over the cash for it, it's not worth anything necessarily. How often do we sit and think about the fact that God incarnate died for me? I'm sure we've all had a moment to think about. That's probably why you broke down and came to Christ understanding your position and the fact that he saved you and loved you so much. But there's a reason why we do communion under the Lord's table over and over and over and over because that gives us our marching orders. That gives us our mission. We are so valuable to Jesus, each one of you. Beyond measure. He loves you. And I think it's worth it right now. I would I'd be derelict in my duties. I think I said the same thing last time. If you don't know Jesus today, understand that today can be the day of salvation for you. And it's okay. There's a lot of people in here that love you. And God loves you. So I'm just going to quickly run through what it is to understand and to believe in Jesus. One me and you and Caleb and everybody in this room is a sinner. And two, God is a righteous judge. He is holy and just, and there is no way to come to him. The penalty for our sin is eternal separation from him forever and ever and ever. Three, just like that French press that was stuck in the excrement, It got bleached. It got bleached. God bent down, picked us up out of it. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to change our position. Our position was where it was. We were stuck. But he loved us so much, he came and died for us. And simply by believing in him, we see it in verse 21, you can have eternal life. That's amazing news. So I invite you today, if you don't know Jesus, what's stopping you? If you have questions, please come up here afterwards and ask. There's no dumb questions when it comes to this. Because you can walk out of this door, sitting here right now, and the lights can go just like that. I think the mic just went out just like that. Don't move too much. All right. Understand, boasting in the Lord is worship. And how do you boast in the Lord? Look here at 31. In the Lord and in 30, in Christ Jesus. Boast in your position. That's what it is. Thank you, God, for my position. Thank you, God, for what you did for me. We literally exist to worship God and to lead others to him. So boast. Right? The right way, right? We've seen the wrong way, but don't be ashamed of it. There's a lot we have to glory in. Thank the Lord for it. I'm so grateful for all of you. Let's pray. Father God, I'm grateful for the fact that you've given us a word that we can study and we can pull such truth out of. Thank you that regardless of where we started, we're in a place that the world can only look at and turn their heads sideways and just not understand. Lord, may each one of us in here today sit and just think about our identity in you. There is no limit to the amount of time we can spend thinking about it and recognizing who you are and what you've done in every act of our spirit. Let it just be worshipful. God, I just ask that you would bless these people. Bless this body, Grace Bible Church. It's in your name we pray. Amen.